So Finalysis combines the data made popular in fantasy football with the latest sports betting trends, and that's how we find you the sharpest angles. And for that, we bring in the lead betting analyst from PicksWise, Jared Smith. Here we are, Jared, now week three. We've had a couple of weeks here of data to kind of populate your algorithm, and uh, you found a few gems this week. I hope that the, I, I hope the circuitry is are, are working very well for you uh, today. We start things off with the Eagles and the Commanders game. Washington is getting seven in this game. Do you believe this is the, the Philly team that we saw on Monday? This is an interesting spot because. In your mind, you watch what Philly did to Minnesota, and you're very impressed on Monday night. Now they have to turn around and they have to go on the road and face a divisional team, and that's something that Jalen Hurts hasn't really had a lot of success in so far, 0-4 against the spread in NFC East road games throughout his very brief. It's a small sample size, but again, the handicap makes sense, and if you want to widen the sample size slightly, 4-7 and seven against the spread on the road, period, regardless of opponent. So I, I think that makes sense when you think about who Jalen Hurts is as a quarterback at this stage of his career. Very dangerous with his legs, dynamic when able to find that first read in the progression and maybe play action on the edge. But when he's forced to stay in the pocket and make throws down the field, that's uh, been a struggle for him. When he's on the road in tougher environments, that's been a struggle for him. This is going to be one of those litmus test games. Now, I'm not saying Washington's defense is, you know, the, the, the 85 Bears here. They've had their problems, too. But they've been okay with containing Hurts in his two prior games last year against Jack Del Rio's bunch. So this is going to be a fascinating uh, matchup from a defensive perspective, Washington's defense against Jalen Hurts, and also the Eagles' defense. I'm not in love with what Jonathan Gannon's unit has done. I know, you know, Kirk Cousins basically handed the ball off to Darius Slay three times on Monday night, but this is an Eagles defense that is worse in tackling grade so far through three or through two weeks heading into week three. So I could see there being a little bit of a room on the ground for, you know, a, 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 an opportunity, I think, for Washington's offense to move the football. And it's a Carson Wentz revenge game, oh, by the way. <laughs> so there are some things to like about Washington in this spot. And I think the market's gotten a little bit too stretched towards Philly at seven. Now we're seeing six and a half, six. I, I do think Washington keeps this game close. I tell you what, after week one, I mean, speaking of that Monday night game, that Philly uh, Minnesota game, after week one, I think that, uh, you know, a majority of betters were buying into that Vikings future Super Bowl bet. And by week two, they were looking for the cash out option because that Vikings team looked completely different. And you have to wonder how much of it was the Vikings, how much of it was the Eagles. But when you look at this matchup, when you see elements that sometimes can't be measured, you brought it up. It's the Carson Wentz revenge game. How do you find a way to create a metric for something that is immeasurable like his focus for this week? Um, there's a lot of things in the gambling space that are not quantifiable. Um, there are things that are, and I think the way that I like to go about my business on a week-to-week -week basis is to find some of the quantifiable metrics that are undervalued, at least what the market is presenting us. In the particular case of Carson Wentz, there is no quantifiable metric. It's an intangible. And unfortunately, intangibles is what dictates NFL results on a week-to-week -week basis, i.e. that Jets-Browns game a couple weeks ago. Uh, nobody could have predicted. There is no metric that say, up, you know, you know, up 13 with a minute 30 to go. The Jets are going to come back and win that game because of X, Y, and Z. You just have to kind of read between the lines. And the market, sometimes I put my faith in the sharp betters that have been doing this for a lot longer than me and are a lot smarter than me. And when I see certain numbers and thresholds get approached, in this case, seven being the key number, and then instead of pushing through, it goes in the other direction towards Washington, it makes me believe that there's something there to at least you know hang your hat on with Carson Wentz. So after I see that market move, then I will look at the numbers and say, okay, is there something in the data that points me in a positive direction towards that market move. In this case, you can make a really strong case that Carson Wentz feels very comfortable in Scott Turner's offense. This is an offense for the last couple of years that have been, you know, quarterbacked by the likes of Taylor Heineke and Ryan Fitzpatrick. Those guys don't have strong arms. They're not going to push the ball down the field. That's what Carson Wentz does best. He's a top 10 quarterback in air yards through the first two weeks, and he's got a trio of weapons around him with Dotson and Samuel and Terry McLaurin that I think complement his 
aggressive pursuit of pushing the ball down the field, which is what Scott Turner wants to do. So there isn't a metric that I could say <laughs> Carson Wentz is going to play good against the Eagles because, but I think the overall vibe around this Washington offense, in my mind, is a little bit undervalued compared to what the market's telling us. I'm glad you brought up the metrics because sometimes it's really having someone here that can kind of help translate what we're seeing in number movement. Uh, Wentz's other team, uh, the Indianapolis Colts, are now uh, six-point dogs to the Kansas City Chiefs. That line has moved from two and a half to six. What is that telling you? Yeah, this one's been all over the place. Um, so to me, the Chiefs are a team that are very dangerous. And I don't want to take anything away from how good they can be at their peak. But again, the NFL markets are the most efficient markets of all the gambling markets out there. And when I see lines move through key numbers and significantly in short periods of time, it makes me think that there's value on the other side. Even if I'm down on that team and their performance through the first two weeks of the year and I'm high on the other team. We've talked about the Chiefs. I, I think the Chiefs are a, a Super Bowl contender hands down and Patrick Mahomes is in the MVP conversation. But this is a spot where I could see value on the other side. You mentioned that it moved from two and a half to six. It actually touched seven here in the desert until we saw some of that sharp buyback on Indy. And the reason for that being, well, Michael Pittman's gonna be back this week. Alec Pierce is gonna be back this week. No Shaq Leonard. We just heard word on that Thursday morning. That's a negative for this Colts defense. But I'll be honest, this Colts defense couldn't have played any worse through the first two weeks. And when you look at their game against Jacksonville, Gus Bradley's scheme, so Indy's going from a cover two to a cover three. Matt Eberflus for the last few years, now he's in Chicago. He was the defensive coordinator. In steps Gus Bradley year one with this cover three pressure scheme. Well, the Colts aren't generating any pressure. They only got the Trevor Lawrence three out of 30 dropbacks on Sunday. That's the lowest rate in Trevor Lawrence's career. And Jacksonville's not known for a great offensive line. So what does it say to me that a cover three scheme led by Gus Bradley that's known for pressure is not generating pressure? Well, maybe the pieces aren't all quite fitting together just yet and they need a little more time to gel it's the first year in a new scheme makes perfect sense so i see upside there because when i see something that i think should be happening and it hasn't happened so far in my eyes gus bradley's going to ratchet up the pressure a little bit more this week now we'll see what that looks like against patrick mahomes but this is a home opener for indy they're zero and two this is a spot that they need to have if they want to be taken seriously in the afc playoff picture and i think we're talking a lot differently about this chiefs team today if that pick six last Thursday doesn't take place, which is a very fluky play, you're driving in for a touchdown, the Chargers, and then all of a sudden you're sticking it back in the end zone in the other direction. I think Indy's going to run the ball with Jonathan Taylor. The Chiefs have struggled against the run, and I think those weapons with Matt Ryan, with Pittman and Pierce back will do enough to keep this game within the number. I don't love fading Patrick Mahomes, but again, the numbers move to a point now where I have to take Indy seriously. Especially with what you've looked at out of Indy in the first two weeks. I mean, the Texans and then last week, the Jaguars completely blew them out. I, this has to feel like for Frank Reich, like this is kind of like a season on the brink moment here in week three for the Colts. Absolutely. And we need to see more from Matt Ryan. Period. End of story. You give him all this money, you bring him in. It's the sixth starting quarterback in six years for the Colts. We need to see more. Right now, he's 27th out of 33 qualifying quarterbacks in EPA per play plus completion percentage over expectation, which is kind of that <laughs> analytical metric that we shoved together to kind of grade quarterbacks' efficiency ratings. He's 27th out of 33 qualifying quarterbacks right now. That needs to improve. He's got a great run game, a good offensive line, and now he's got some weapons back in tow. I think we're going to see upside there. The Chiefs' defense can be had at times. They're on the road again in a home opener environment for the Colts. And you said it, desperation for Frank Reich. Are we going to see gadget plays? Are we going to see fourth down where they might punt? Hey, we're going to go for it because we need this game. I could see there being a little more vibe of desperation. It makes it hard to handicap volatility wise. But at the end of the day, when the numbers now move through a key number and now approaching a second key number, when this line opened at two, three, just, you know, a short time ago, I feel safe that I'm at least getting value with Indy. Even if it's the wrong side, I feel like I'm getting value with the Colts. All right, let's look at that Lions-Vikings game because it's an interesting game, not because of the line, but because of the over-under at 51 and a half. The Lions have put up 38 and 36 points in their first two weeks. Is this an explosive offense? Is this the more explosive offense of the two we're going to see on the field on Sunday? No. 
Um, but <laughs> thank you, I will thank you. That, that was a nice <laughs> ice cold bucket of humility that you just splashed on me right there. I was getting excited about him. I was saying, Rob Brown, I was getting excited about the freaking Lions. And here, <laughs> I am excited about the Lions, not for explosive reasons. I think for efficiency reasons. Their offensive line, you could say, is one of the best in the league. They're getting back Frank Rag now this week. They're starting center. That's a huge get for them. DeAndre Swift still looks a little gimpy. He played last week against Washington. He played well. I, I think he'll continue to play. I don't know what the snap count will be. I don't know what his actual status is. But I'm guessing it's not going to be the full workload for uh, DeAndre Swift. On the other side of the ball, Kirk Cousins could not have played any worse on Monday night. Now he goes back home in a very friendly environment against the Lions defense that plays the most man coverage in the NFL. Aaron Glenn, their defensive coordinator, I know we know that name very well in the New York City area. He couldn't play man last year because the Lions were so undermanned at the cornerback position. Now, a little healthier a year into that scheme, Aaron Glenn, who's, you know, hot to trot, he loves to get after people, bump and run. That's the kind of style he wants to play. You remember him covering, covering him during his Jets days. That's the kind of corner that he was. So now we're starting to see that bump and run man coverage with Detroit. Well, guess what? The best quarterback in the league over the last two years against man coverage has been Kirk Cousins. So I think we're going to see a bounce back effort from that Vikings offense. And we talked about the Lions offense. They have been more explosive than last year when Jared Goff was one of the worst uh, A-dot quarterbacks in the league, average depth of target, wasn't pushing the ball down the field. Well, now he's a top 10 quarterback in that category through the first two weeks of the season. And you're seeing Amon Ross St. Brown step forward. You're seeing some of those other weapons for the Lions become prominent in an offense that is now pushing the ball down the field. That breeds well to betting it over. So I feel like we're going to see a bounce back effort from Cousins. I love that line's offensive line, moving the football and keeping the chains going. So to me, points is is going to be the vibe in this game between the Lions and the Vikings. And right now it appears like the Joes are agreeing with you because 92% of the money is on the over in this game. So, And that's the best part about pay, playing the over. You're always in it. <laughs> You're always in it until the final <laughs> horn sounds. Um, all right, the teaser. Now, this is where you move the line in your favor by six points in exchange for parlaying it with yet another teaser. Uh, this week, you're teasing the Packers getting eight in Tampa and the Broncos getting seven and a half hosting the Niners. What, what are you looking at with these two games? And I love this spot for Denver. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo in his first start, post Trey Lance injury. I, I know he played well and the team rallied around him against the Seahawks. Very different animal going up against the Seattle defense at home than going on the road and having to face the Broncos defense. I, and I know the narrative has been very negative around Nathaniel Hackett and it's deserving. He's looked overwhelmed through his first two weeks, but it was his first two weeks as a head coach in the NFL. And the first game was arguably the most difficult situation for any first year head coach to be put in going on the road to a hostile environment in prime time in a place where your quarterback has played his whole career and now he has to go back and deal with all the distractions so there's been a lot of things to like about this denver team and there's been some things that we can certainly knock but i don't know if the line flip is worthy here and there are some professional uh, uh gamblers that i take very seriously that put a two-point upgrade maybe two and a half from Trey Lance to Jimmy G. I think that's why the line flipped. But that being said, it's still Jimmy G who is a little bit easier to prepare for, I think, than Trey Lance. He's stationary in the pocket and he's gonna try to throw the ball down the field. Whereas Trey Lance is gonna move around and you don't know where that spot's gonna be. So now we get this Denver as a short underdog in this spot and we get to move them through two key numbers, the most key numbers, the only real key numbers that we really should be moving lines through on teasers every week and it's a low total game and it's a prime time game and the altitude i think will play a factor especially early in the year before these teams have their full cardiovascular health um so to me this is a perfect spot for denver the green bay game i'm shocked how often do we see two <laughs> aaron Rodgers and tom brady and the total is 41. It, what does that tell you about the way this game is going to be played so I, I think the identity of the bucks and packers is changing before our very eyes 
Green Bay's been a little bit undervalued on the defensive side. Tampa Bay's defense has been heralded and talked about for years with former Jets coach Todd Bowles now at the helm. And this is a defense that's been fantastic. On the other side, I think Green Bay can run the ball a little bit, though, because as good as the Bucks' defense has been, they haven't been as stout against the run as they have in recent years. And I think the strength of the Packers' offense right now is that offensive line as long as Bakhtiari's back and running the football with Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. So that's the vibe I get in that mm. packers Bucks game. Tight, both quarterbacks not going to make a mistake. The last quarterback to touch it probably wins. But I definitely say uh, if we're moving it through those two key numbers of three and seven, Packers plus eight, great teaser like this week. Well, I tell you what, you, you try to uh, – if the idea is to keep the ball out of the hands of Tom Brady, the best way to do it is to have a one-two punch like Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. Do you expect to see that Packers offense – shift from an Aaron Rodgers led offense to a run first offense throughout the rest of the season. Absolutely. I, and listen, I they've got some injury problems too. they're dealing with this week. I saw Randall Cobb was uh, sick and they've got uh, I think uh, Alan Lazard, you know, in and out of the lineup as well. Looks like uh, Christian Watson, their rookie, also having some issues. Romeo Dobbs might be the last man standing there in Green Bay. If you thought that the Packers offense was just going to pick up where they left off because Aaron Rodgers is back there, I think that's a little naive. I, listen, I'm not saying that they're just going to completely, you know, fall off the map here, but I think it's fair to say that, again, the identity of what the Packers are is changing. At their core, I, I think Green Bay is a run first team, anyways, even when they had uh, Devontae Adams last year. This is a team that likes to slow the pace. They like to control the tempo. They've got a great offensive line and a great defense. So I, you, and now you're taking those weapons away and they're being forced to, to, to be the running team that they maybe were at their core over the last few years. But the Aaron Rodgers mask certainly makes you think that they're this explosive offense that wants to run and gun up the field all day. That's not who they are. And Matt LaFleur, you know, has come out and said, like, I, I want to be a defensive first team that runs the ball and controls the clock. Bill Parcells-esque. And I think you're seeing that play out. Now, do they have the personnel to do it? We'll see. They've got two <laughs> offensive linemen, Jenkins and Bakhtiari, at the tackle spots that have been in and out of the lineup for the last two years. And their defensive line hasn't played as well as I would have hoped. But that being said, I think they've got two dudes in the backfield that can absolutely get it. And if the running game does start to churn out positive yardage, this is an Aaron Rodgers play action game that's going to be very dangerous as well because nobody puts the ball in the right place and makes the right decisions better than Aaron, especially in late game situations. Tough spot on the road. I think the Bucks defense is maybe maybe not as strong as they have been in prior years. At least they haven't shown it yet. And they've got their own problems they're dealing with. Offensive line issues. They've got Godwin out. Mike Evans suspended. I don't really like the vibe in Tampa right now. And I'm going to fade him, especially when it's a Green Bay team that I trust the quarterback not to make that key mistake, just like Jameis Winston did last week, pick six at the end of the game, totally ruin our teaser. But I feel like Aaron Rodgers won't make that mistake and we'll keep this one within the number. Well, you keep it on the ground. You keep your star quarterback upright as long as possible, especially if he's an aging quarterback. That is his best bets and his favorite teaser of the week. Make sure you check out our other segments on the Jets and the Giants. For Jared Smith of PicksWise, I'm Steve Overmeyer. This is Finalysis.